So if Jesus calls us to rise up and live an abundant life, I want you to think about this this morning. John 10.10, 10, and he says, I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. And the, and the, the, the good definition is my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. And then why does it so often feel like we're just surviving and getting by here? Life has a way of beating you down, doesn't it? I want you to think about it if you've never thought about it before. Abundant life doesn't mean and especially long life. Do you know people who have lived a long, long time are very miserable? You can't say they have abundant life even though they have a lot of years. Abundant life is not an easy, comfortable life. I know people that their life is pretty easy and comfortable. They seem to have everything provided for. And by any human measure, they should have an easy, comfortable life. But there's something desperately empty in their soul. And whatever abundant life is, they don't have it. No, abundant life doesn't refer to the ease of your life, the comfort of your life, the length of your life. Abundant life is a life of satisfaction and contentment in Jesus Christ. And you can't put a price on that. That makes somebody truly living extra life, abundant life. That's what Jesus has for you. I think about people who live their lives with a profound sense of discontentment. That they have a gnawing unhappiness because they feel like, listen, there's more to this. I know there's more to it. I know I'm empty. I need more than this. They need the abundant life that comes from knowing, Jesus, you are my shepherd. You take care of me. You provide for my needs. And as long as I stay close to my shepherd, my life is filled with contentment and abundance. And that's the title of the message, I'm Surviving. I like that line in that song, says, crawling out these sheets to see another day. You feel like that? You're up in the morning, you're oh boy, gotta face another day. So here's the question, how can we be surviving when we're supposed to be thriving? And John 10.10 10 says, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. See, God desires that we thrive and not survive this life. And let me give you a definition of these two words, survive, is to remain alive or in existence to continue to exist. Does it feel like sometimes we're just existing? And then thrive, um, it can be in the same situation with all the circumstances that you are in a survival mode. You could be in a thriving mode, and the difference is the definition, to grow vigorously or to flourish, to progress toward or realize a goal despite or because of circumstances of conflict. So it's, it's just a different way of reacting to negative stimuli in our lives. And it's all starts up here. Listen, the validity of Christianity in our lives is, is not what we know inside. It's how we respond outwardly. I mean, validity simply means the proof. And, um, and so we really need to look at, at the process of how we deal with negativity in our lives so that we don't become people who survive this life, but thrive in spite of the difficulties of this life. And so that's the path we're going to travel this morning. I have a lot of information we're going to hit you really quick with, right? So let's pray before we start. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, God, that it is a firm foundation we can build our lives on, God. It helps us, help us also understand that unless we apply it, God, it doesn't work. And so help us, Lord, to um, not just read it, not just think about it, but work on applying it to our lives so that we might walk through this life in spite of all that's going on and still thrive. While we're here is, is, is one of the purposes you came here for us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So you are called to thrive in Christ. And 1 Peter 2, 2 says, like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk that so that it may, what? grow. See, God, God has grown up in your salvation. That simply means, you know, we're never, I don't care if you've been a Christian for a month or you've been a Christian for 20 years, God wants you still to be in a continual process of growing spiritually. He doesn't want us to become stagnant. And see, when we become stagnant, we're, we're surviving. And, and you can be saved for many years and just be surviving through this life. If we stop growing. And so Christianity is a continual growing process. None of us 
are going to attain this until we're home with the Lord. Thriving in Christ, Ephesians 4, 13 and 14 says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be made mature in the Lord. And so this growth, this growth processes and then there's maturity levels and then there's greater maturity levels in Christ. It doesn't end. But when you run into mature Christians, um, as, as you go through this walk of Christianity with Christ in your life, um, you find yourself more in agreement. Measuring up to the full and complete standard of man or other Christians, does that say that? No. So God has a standard for us to, to live up to and a standard for us to grow to. In Christ. And the results of this growth, when we reach this standard of Christ, watch what happens. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. And so God's saying this when you when you start to mature in me, you'll, you'll actually be able to actually see through all the lies or the lies of the world, or the lies of false teachers. But it takes this maturing process and this growth in Christ to reach that level. And there are many people in the Bible who chose to survive instead of thrive. And so we're going to give you some you know, examples of people who, who chose a life of survival instead of thriving with God. In Deuteronomy 30, 19, says, Today I've given you the choice between life and death, and between blessing and curses. And he's saying, listen, I've set before you, listen, a, a possibility of two avenues for your life. And one avenue is going to be full of blessings and a thriving life, and the other avenue is going to be uh, cursed, and you'll, you'll just survive through this life. And I've set this before you. And what does he say? Now I call heaven and earth to witness the choice. Who makes? You make. And so much of our, our our um, life to thrive is, is based upon the choices we make, based upon what God has set before us. All right? Just because God puts it before you doesn't mean it applies to you. Again, God's word only works when we apply it to, to our lives. So when God gives us information, we're responsible for the choices we make. And, and there's an, I, I mentioned this last week, um, the Bible says, to those who are enlightened, more is required. So when God opens your eyes to something, you now the requirement falls upon each of us as individuals. What we do, what will we do with the information we see? In Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. And a man reaps what he sows. Ladies, I guess you're off on that one. <laughs> you know, I was going to change that to a person, but I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Ladies, you don't have to worry about it. You're not responsible for any decision you make. We can take a joke. <laughs> We reap what we sow. You know, when God says, hey, you know what? This is the, the path for a thriving life, and we do not make the changes in our life or the choices in our life for that to happen, then we're, we, we will sow that. We'll, we'll be on a different path. And life will never really feel as fulfilling as God came for it to be for each of us. So Adam and Eve, you know, here we have the first people um, you know, the odds of doing this aren't very good with the numbers of people I'm going to put before you, but Adam and Eve were thriving, right? In Genesis 2.25. Now, the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. So they're in a, imagine the situation. They're in a perfect environment. They, they don't age. Everything's great. Animals don't attack. Everything is just the way God created it to be, right? Imagine you walk around naked, like, like a dog, right? Walk around naked, you don't even know you're naked, right? <laughs> then we're worrying about what people think about you. Think, think just that alone. You know, where you, you don't have to get up in the morning and go, oh, how much work our bodies are, right? Just, just to prep for the day. You, you don't have to get up and match clothes. <laughs> what an easy life, huh? How easy they had it, right? Yet they chose surviving, disobeying the information God gave them, right? Right? Isn't that what caused them to head down this road? So the Lord God banished them from that thriving life that they had. We're just filling it in with the information. All because the information God gave them for a thriving life, they chose to disobey. 
So the Lord God made a serpent from the garden of Eden, and he sent Adam and Eve out to cult oh Adam to cultivate the ground which uh, from which he had been made. Now Cain was thriving, and that's Adam and Eve's son. So they had um, uh, Abel and Cain as sons, and so later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel, and when they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, and while Cain cultivated the ground. So basically, Abel, Abel's a shepherd, was working with animals, and Cain is a farmer, right? You, some of you know the story, right? And then God told them to bring an offering, and one brings exactly what God said, and the other one brought what he thought God, he thought God wanted, what he should do, right? Again, following information that he, not following the information God gave him, but the information that he thought in his mind he wanted to do. And what was the results of that? Of course, he, he chose a life surviving, Genesis 4, 16, so Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, and God just sent him off. And because why, he ended up killing his brother, you know? People before the flood were thriving, Genesis 6, 1, then people began to multiply on the earth and daughters were born unto them and really they had long lives. You, you read the lifespan of people back then, you know, some were at 900 years old. Boy, I don't know if I'd want to be 900 years old. <laughs> Yet they chose surviving in Genesis 6, 5. The Lord observed the extent. This, this is why. This is why all the negativity came their way in their lives. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. And, and I like that verse in the Bible that says, God even looks at a child at the way they think. And God examines, imagine that. God examines how you think. He's looking down, he's examining the thoughts people. Lot was thriving in Genesis 13, 5. Lot, who was traveling with Abraham, had also become very wealthy with flocks of sheep and goats, herds of cattle, and many tents, and his life was thriving. He was becoming rich, and he was with a great guy who was following God. His life was going pretty good, wasn't it? And he chose a life of surviving, Genesis 13, 12, and 13. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tent to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. And here's the but. The people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord, and that's the path he chose for his life and his family. And read, you can read how, how that turned out for him, and not just him, him and his family, and the, the bad path that took him, all because of a choice he made with the information God gave. Esau was thriving. Genesis 25, 28, Isaac loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game he brought home. So, you know, Isaac's sons are um, Isaac and Esau. And, uh, you know, Isaac, I mean, I mean, yeah, Esau and, and Jacob. And, um, but Isaac, the dad, his favorite was Esau, wasn't it? And so he's, he's thriving, his life's going good, and he's a, he's a good hunter, he's, he's got everything going for him. But he also chose a life of surviving in Genesis 25, 32, look, I'm dying of starvation. It's basically, he comes home from hunt, hunting, and he's hungry, basically, he's really, really hungry. You know how you go, oh man, I'm dying of starvation, right? You're not dying of starvation. The people in countries don't eat for a week. We go, oh man, I'm dying. That's Esau right now, right? <laughs> dying of starvation. Well, look at his response because of what good is my birthright to me now? And so basically, and, and then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew, and Esau ate the meal and got up and left, and he showed contempt for his, for his rights as the firstborn son. The firstborn son in, 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 in back in them days was where the blessing of God followed. And that, that meant, you know what that meant to Esau, Bolas Luke? <laughs> so the things of God were important to him. And so he chose a life of surviving. And you can look at how his life went, too. And God's blessing ended up falling on the younger brother and not on him. The nation of Israel was thriving, Exodus 3.17, I have promised to rescue you from your oppression in Egypt, and I will lead you to a land flowing with milk and honey. The promises of God are on them. They went through all the plagues of Egypt, got past the Red Sea, they walked through on dry ground, he's feeding them with manna in the desert. Everything's going great. He's going to bring them to the promised land, and he promises them a land that's going to be amazing. 
And yet they chose a life of surviving, Numbers 14.30, not one of you will enter that land, I swore, with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. And why? What was their choice? Because God said, I want you to do this. And they said, no, they wouldn't walk into the land. Again, God gives the information, and we make choices what we're going to do with it. And Israel's you know, got, a, got a history of, of doing this with God. And here we have Isaiah 44, 6. This is what the Lord says, Israel's king and redeemer. The Lord Almighty, I am the first, I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. That's extra. I just put that extra, extra. Apart from me, there is no God. There is no other God. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't care what religion tells you. The Bible is really clear. There is no other God. They're just pe thoughts people made up or images people made up. There's only one God. And that, that's going to make a lot of people angry, but that's the truth. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one's coming to heaven except through me. One, one way. One way. So here we have it. The nation of Israel, God is their king. Imagine that, huh? We, would you worry if God was running the world? No. Oh. Think about that. It's 1 Samuel 8, 4, and 5. So the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And what did they ask for? Give us the king. What are they saying? You know what? We don't want God as our king anymore. We want a person to be our king. I mean, and what was the results of that? We would see, you know, a few good kings and a bunch of bad kings, and the northern side would get like 10 bad kings, and gradually they would be carried away, carried away by the Assyrian army. The southern side would go a little further, and gradually they'd be carried away by the Babylon army, all because they had bad kings who led them down bad paths in their life. They didn't want God as their king. They wanted people instead. Again, God gave them the information, but they chose a different path. And then we come into the New Testament, they do the same thing. A nation of Israel was surviving, right? At this point, they just survived because they're under Roman rule right now. And they're looking for somebody who will take them out and be their king. And Jesus comes along, he's born in a manger, right? And it says, Pilate said to the people, look, here is your king. And he was presented before them. And again, what do they do? The choice is to continue surviving. Luke 23, 18, then a mighty roar rose from the crowd with one voice and said, kill him. Release Barabbas. And what did they do? They chose a murderer over the king of kings, Lord of lords. And they said, let his blood be on us and our children. Whew. Choices we make with the information God gives. Achan was thriving, Joshua 6, 27. So the Lord was with Joshua and his reputation spread throughout the land. This was when Joshua was actually conquering the land. Israel was becoming more and more rich because it was just devouring everybody in front of them. And Achan is part of this and a thriving uh, part of history for, the, for Israel. Yet he chose surviving and dying, and not just himself. In Joshua 7 and 1, but Israel violated the instructions about the things set apart for the Lord. A man named Achan had, what did he do? He had stolen some things that were dedicated to the Lord, and the Lord was very angry with Israel. And that's another message in itself. God was angry with the entire Israel because of what one man did. And so what you do affects other people's lives, right? Um, I'm trying to think. So does anybody know the outcome of his life? When he, he finally was, this is a really good story, Drew, when he was finally found out, he was stoned, right? They killed him. But they didn't just kill him. Who else did they kill? His entire family. Yeah, so remember, that the choices you make with the information God gives you doesn't just affect you, it affects your family, too. And it just has, a, you know, when you throw a rock in the water and you see the rings and they go further and further out, it has a wider effect than what we really... Solomon was living and thriving. This is probably the peak of Israel. Um, 1 Kings 10.23, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all other kings of the earth. And in all honesty, if you, you look at the riches of Solomon, uh, I don't think anyone to this day matches the level that this guy received from the Lord. Just completely blessed it in every area of his life. Yet he chose a legacy of surviving in 1 Kings 11, 11. So now the Lord said to him, since you have not kept why what? Covenant and have 
disobey my decrees, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to one of your servants. Again, choices made off the information God had given. Judas chose surviving, Matthew 28, 15. He walked with Jesus for three years, right? And what was his choice at the end of three years? How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? Demas chose surviving, 2 Timothy 4.10. Paul said this of this man, Demas has deserted me because he what? Loves the things of this life. Many chose surviving, John 6.66. 6, 6. From that time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed Jesus. Chose surviving, 2 Timothy 3.4. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, love pleasures rather than God. Chose surviving, Genesis 2.24, that is why a man leaves his father or mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Romans 1.27, and the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with their lust to each other. Men did shameful things with other men, and as a result of their sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Furthermore, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a, what type of mind? Depraved mind, so that they uh, do what ought not to be done. Let's talk, talk about the topic of homosexuality. You want to know where God stands with that? Well, that's where he stands with it. Now, you choose what you do with the information received. And if you step outside of what God tells you you were actually made for, then you choose a life of surviving. And I know we live in a day and age where that's not popular to be said, but we're going to stand and build our lives on what the foundation of what God's Word says, not what the world says. Chose surviving, Genesis 5, 2. So he created them male and female and blessed them. He named them mankind when they were created. Deuteronomy 22, 5. A woman must not wear men's clothing, nor a man wear women's clothing, for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this. Transgender. You want to know where God stands with that? He stands right there. I don't care what society says. That's where God stands on it. And if you choose, if a person chooses that path with their lives, they're choosing a life of survival because God's not with that type of thinking. Choose surviving. Psalms 127.3. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Right? Psalms 139.13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Abortion. I don't care what society says. This is where God says. No, it's wrong in my sight. Choose surviving, Ephesians 5.18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit of God. You know, there's so many things. I'm just picking like some, some things. What's God saying? Listen, don't let alcohol control your life. It's not gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it can ruin your life. All right? Make sure, you know, God is controlling your life. Be filled with the Spirit. Okay? And then that's up to, you know, there's so many things. That, you know, this is one of those things you have to decide on. You know, just don't let it control you. I mean... You have to be wise in the choices and decisions you make with your life. Many choose surviving, Matthew 7, 13. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go through it. That's, that's We're talking mankind as a whole now. That most people will choose a life of surviving, and the end will lead to destruction. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that way. Many Christians choose surviving. Matthew 9, 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the what? The workers, the people who actually do the work. And so even amongst Christianity, God seen there's only a few that will choose a life that is thriving over surviving. Because if you think Christianity is all about you just going to work and living your life, you don't understand Christianity. God has a great call upon our lives as individuals to live a life for him. Right? Why do so many choose to survive in this world, even amongst Christians, where Jesus really wants us to thrive? And so that's the question we have to ask ourselves, because we're all prone to do it. Because, well, I won't say, well, I'll give you the answer. John 10, 10, I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying
Well, I would say that the two greatest expressions of human sin or brokenness are fear and laziness. You know, lots of Christian preachers all zero in on various sins of one kind or another, but I would say you could track just about every expression of human brokenness down to their root cause and you would find fear and or laziness. Fear, that is, I'm, I'm afraid to embrace change or I'm, in, I'm afraid to take this step because I fear what chain reaction will set off or, or, or what it might result in. Or laziness, which is, yeah, this is interesting and I might read a bit more and I'll explore it a bit down the track. But you have a look, I mean, domestic violence, it's either fear or laziness. Uh, fear of the uh, repercussions of dealing with your relationship or laziness, I, I just couldn't be bothered changing. You have, you have a look at uh, any kind of sin, lust, uh, uh, violence, uh, drunkenness, you name it, you, any kind of human brokenness. Why won't people change? Because they're afraid of the consequences of the change or they're, they're simply too lazy to make those choices. We all know what it's like, you know, I need to lose weight, why won't you? I'm just too lazy to, or I'm, I'm frightened to. Uh, you need to deal with your, your estrangement from your father, so, you know, deal with that. Yeah, I need to do that, but I'm just too afraid of how he'll react, or I'm too lazy to actually make the trip out there to see him, or whatever. You watch it time and again. I always think of it as like reins on a charging horse, you know. We were destined to charge, you know. We're destined to run free, but fear and laziness just holds us back. Fear and laziness will say, blame these circumstances. Fear and laziness will say, be bitter and angry about these situations. Fear and laziness every time will, will ask you to become static in the situation. Whereas if we dare to believe what Jesus calls us to is courage and effort and sacrifice and work, those kinds of choices invite us to step beyond the circumstance. Not to ignore it, not to pretend it didn't happen, but to be able to draw from it the very best that we can and to move forward in significant ways. And for me, you know, this is at the very essence or centre of, of the gospel message about Jesus. Like, Jesus dies on the cross to deal with human sin. Now, what does that mean? I think what, what it means is that Jesus kind of lays a, an axe into the root of, of fear and sin in our lives, and they begin to wither. They're like a, a vine that's grown up all around our souls and it's like the work of Jesus is laying an axe to the to the very root of the trunk of that vine and slowly but surely over years it starts to wither we start to charge we start to run free I'm mixing my metaphors with vines and charging horses but you might get the gist of it and so I would say that uh, that for me there's something marvelous about having followed Jesus for a long time and to see that I am less and less lazy I'm less and less fearful to think, but I don't know if this is, uh, it's not a general rule, but I tend to think fear is stronger as you're younger and laziness a bit as you get older. But I mean, I've been frightened and lazy all of my life. I'm an expert in fear and laziness. So. But if you are expecting that you can embrace a life that will call out the most courageous choices in your life and will invite you to make the most sacrificial or hardworking effort in your life, you're going to be a far better off person for doing it. It would be a new way of being human, which would be about courage. It would be about effort and work. It would be about embracing uh, a journey to become all that humankind was intended to be. This quest, this exploration of relationship with God, actually doesn't lead you to become closed down in this life. It doesn't stunt you. The pursuit of God countermands fear and laziness and invites us, in fact, to embrace everything humankind was intended to be. So you'd be afraid, but countermand that fear. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. If you're expecting that, that's laziness. But if you embrace courage, embrace the work of pursuing God, and I promise you, you're a better person at the end of that process, because what Jesus wants in your life is for you to be freed, to, to embrace the new way of being human that he modeled for us. So God wants us to thrive, but the problem is we have to decide to make the changes, and really it's difficult, I mean, I think sometimes the older you are, the more difficult it is. And so often we just kind of go, yeah, you know, I know I probably should. 
Matthew 16, 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must what? Yeah, just, see, so what I'm going to do is give you some requirements now that God says that you have to have to actually choose this abundant life. And this is something for us all to think about. You can't love the wrong things if you want the abundant life. In 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in Be careful what you choose here to set your affections on. Have to sacrifice if you want the abundant life. Ephesians 5, 2, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice. And when you live a life of sacrifice, that's a pleasing aroma to God. Have to serve if you want the abundant life. Matthew 23, 11, the greatest among you will be the servants. You want to be great with God, learn to be a servant. Not a person who's expecting to be served. Obedience required if you want the abundant light. Revelation 14, 12. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful to Jesus. You know, it's up to us to look through the Bible and say, hey, this... These are the things God wants me to do. These are the things God doesn't want me to do. It's up to us to make the changes, being obedient to what God would have us to do. Separation is required if you want the abundant life. 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you. Part of the Christian walk is separating from your life and people who are influencing you to go the wrong direction in this life. And I've, I've always said this, there's nothing wrong with having an unsaved friend or communicating with unsaved people, but if they're influencing you to go the wrong way, then you need to break that relationship. Your job as a Christian is to influence them to go the right way. And be very careful. Change required if you want the abundant life. Romans 12, 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then, then when you go through that process, and I, I do believe that's a time process, I don't believe that happens overnight, then you will learn to know God's will for you. Then you'll actually know what God wants you to do while you're doing here. That's what it says. And then you'll start to live the abundant life. When you know it's not, I'm right where God wants me, doing exactly what God wants me, you're going to be excited. Okay, what's going on in your life? You learn to thrive even in a, in the midst of really difficult circumstances. Love with an allegiance if you want the abundant life. And so your love has to be put at, at, a, at an allegiance level if you want to live the abundant life of God. Which anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. That's a high call, isn't it? Be careful where you set your affections. And, and there's nothing wrong with loving others, but make sure your love for God is always above everyone and everything else in this life. You want to live the abundant life. Make sure God has his place on the throne. Remember, he's our king, right? And, and what, it is, what was Israel's the mistake? They wanted a man to rule over them. And so they, they loved people more than they loved God. Don't, let the same, don't make the same mistake Israel made with your life. You make sure God's on the throne. He's your king. Abraham had a great example when God told him to sacrifice his son, right? And what did he do? God, he put God on his throne. He followed in obedience, right? And God was really just testing him, really not testing him. God already knew the outcome. He was testing Abraham so Abraham would know more about himself. God doesn't put you through tests in your life because he doesn't know what you'll do. He does it for you to know what you'll do and to see where you really stand and test your faith so that you might grow. All right. Must be born again if you want the abundant life. John 3, 3, Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless what? They're a good person? Unless you have a lot of good works? Unless you're born again or you're saved, right? Deeds have nothing to do with it. But you don't expect to live an abundant life with God if you haven't taken step one. 
telling others is required if you want the abundant life. Mark 16, 50, when you get saved, it's your, responsible, your responsibility to get out there and tell other people so they can be saved, right? Because what's the commandment? He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So we're now responsible to spread God's word. Do not think you're going to live the abundant life if that's not part of your life. Letting go is required if you want the abundant life. Luke 14, 33, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. And what's that saying? It's, it means you should have an attitude that, you, that well, while we're going through our lives, I should have an attitude while I'm going through my life that, you know what? If this is hindering my walk with God, I need to get it out of my life. I don't care what it is. If, if money's too high, if, 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 if relationships with people are too high, if... if um, you know, sin in certain areas is too high. I need to be willing to give it all up if I want to live the abundant life. Nothing compares if you want the abundant life. Nothing compares to God. Look at Paul. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else, you'll be whole life in the law. The best thing in my life is what Jesus did for me, my Lord and my God. For this sake, I have discarded everything else and counted it all garbage so that I may gain Christ. Jesus has to be better than everything if you want the abundant life. Jesus is the better everything. He's the better boss who gives us a better pay than what we really deserve. He's the better representation of a father who speaks better words over us than even our earthly fathers. He's the better friend who will never leave us or forsake us, who will always stay with us even though we betray him. He's the better everything. And too often we don't know how to show Jesus as the better to the everyday struggles that people are facing. We just say Jesus and think that's enough. We've got to learn how to help people understand that he's the better everything for the longings of their heart. Anything else, listen, anything else when it's above this in our lives is just surviving. You just kind of live in this life hoping it goes the way you want it to go. You're surviving. Be careful then what? How you live. Not as unwise, but as wise. God has given us all the same advice. The Bible's written to us each. Now what would we do with the information God's given us? Revelation 3.17 you say I'm rich and I have everything I want and I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked in my sight. Gain is not godliness. Abundance of things does not measure one's life. You can't think you're thriving. You can think you're actually thriving when you're just surviving in the sight of God. Make sure your life is based upon what God says, not how you feel or what other people think. Because other than that, you're just surviving. Jesus came to give an abundant life. And you either pursue it or are too afraid or lazy to make the changes. Obey and thrive or compromise and survive. And that's pretty much it. We all have the same information, like I said choices we make have a profound effect in our lives and all the people around us. John 10.10, 10, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So the choice we make, will you survive or thrive? Now there's another side to this message that sometimes in the Christian walk, it is survival. But what we need, if we don't have this foundation of thinking, I can't graduate to the next, and maybe I'll do that next week. And, uh, but understand right now, but for us all to concentrate on building our lives on what God said, not on how we feel, not what society says or what they think. Do not let that influence our thinking. We're here to love and serve the Lord, get the gospel to the world, and one day our king is coming home to get us and to bring us to the place that he created us for. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you, God. It, 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 it lights the path, God, for our lives, Lord. It makes it clearer which way to walk in a dark world, Lord. Which will help us all, Lord, to you know, always be examining our lives, you know, and, and trying to you know, you know, make the choices, God, that we already know you've said uh, to take. And 
make those changes, Lord. Stop being so fearful, God. Just trust you're in charge. You know what's going on here. And we'll live our lives for you and serve you all our days here and thrive, God. In Jesus' name, amen. That's it, guys.